It's our community, and I'm Mary Davidson. And as usual, we have a neighbor that is extremely interesting, and his name is Myron Wang. Thank you. Many of you know Myron because he is the CEO of the Alaskan Fur Company, but that's only half of who he is. <laughs> the other half, and the, the part that we're going to talk about today, Myron, is your involvement with the Digital Atlas of Marine Species and Locations, the Damsel Project at the University of Miami. How did a guy in the fur business ever get involved with fish? Well, accidentally I learned to scuba dive once in Acapulco and uh, I started my career being a spear fisherman. Mm -hmm. And I did that for a couple years and you know, this was in the late 50s, early 60s, and uh, one day in Cozumel, our Kansas City dive group, which is about 12 of us, went down to Cozumel, and at that point, uh, we were diving one afternoon after about three dives, and a friend of mine had a brand new Nikonis camera, and he really didn't know anything about cameras, and I went down with my spear gun, and we were about 70 feet on the reef down, and uh, he reached out to get my spear gun. So if he was going to take my spear gun, I had had something to do, so I took his camera. <laughs> well, I shot up his whole roll of film, and since that time, I've never been down with anything but a camera. No intended pun, but you were hooked. I was very hooked. <laughs> had you ever taken photographs before? Well, you know, just casually. Just, and but nothing no, on a scale not like really. That. They taught a bear to dance here. <laughs> <laughs> so you, from th then you came home and bought some equipment, some camera. Well, I, yes, I bought a camera and uh, I, I had a major trip to the Red Sea and uh, I took some pictures which I really wasn't that pleased with mm -hmm. and uh, it just so happened the editor of Skin Diver magazine came to Kansas City for a lecture and uh, I showed him my pictures just to know what I was doing or <laughs> not doing. Uh -huh. And he gave me about a 15 minute survey. And since then, I knew how to take an underwater picture. <laughs> he must have been a very good teacher. He was a very good teacher. <laughs> but the upshot of this thing is that from this taking a camera off of your friend's neck, you donated 5,000 images to the University of Miami. These, now these are all fish, you have to understand. Well, fish, coral, Yeah, but undersea, undersea things. Mm -hmm. under, under everything. 5,000, and these are all slides. All slides, mm -hmm. and they have to be converted and scanned mm -hmm. to put on the internet, to put on the digital and, base. And, uh, yeah, and these are the, these look like some of this is a shark, and, and you have several, these are beautiful. Thank you. I mean, getting these guys to stand still long enough to take their picture is not an easy thing. <laughs> oh, well, it's, it, you know, I always relate it to sports photography. Uh -huh. You have to be there at the right time because it doesn't happen again. <laughs> you know, you can't tell the fish to turn this way and smile. He's more apt to give you his tail than his face. Than his face. So and of that, but of that 5,000, this is not an easy process. Only a th about 1,000 of them have been scanned in to the database. Um, a damsel. It's a lot of work and I have about six students a year that work on the project not full-time but you know they they do it as uh, for credit for their uh, they're mostly masters and doctorates working on the project and they do the science they do the scanning of the slides and uh, the indexing of the numbers we started originally with the librarian and everything had to yeah. be indexed. You know how librarians but, but are. But we can all go to this website at, it's damsel, D-A-M-S-L dot org. Org. And you'll see, and, but it's not just a series of pretty fish pictures because everything is um, formatted in the Darwinian right. style, it's, which is. It's all encyclopedic content. So it's really a digital book. If you want to see a picture of a Myers butterfly fish, you just go to butterfly fish and you take your cursor and you put on butterfly fish and 20 or 30 butterfly fish will come up and you find the one you want, you put your cursor on it and it enlarges it. And underneath that is all the encyclopedic 
Darwinian content. It's the name, the genus, the family, uh, where it was shot, what country, what body of water. Uh, we get it down to the lat long, like Darwin did. <laughs> That's really interesting. When you started spearfishing, did you know a lot about the fish? I mean, you are, um, you could be an ichthyologist if you really wanted to be. I well, mean, but at I, that I kind of am. <laughs> well, see, but at that point, did you know a lot about the fish you were spearing, or did you just? Yes, I knew what I what what you ate and what you didn't eat. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's always good to know. <laughs> yeah, right. yes. But other than that, I mean, you weren't in anywhere near. Oh no. Where you are? No, now. because I'd only been to one or two bodies of water at that time, and uh, uh, Cozumel was. Uh, uh, the first real major league place we went because it was clear and uh, equatorial waters and you told uh, me you didn't do cold no I don't do cold <laughs> I don't go to the North Pole and go under the ice cap well, the reason he said he didn't do cold because I asked him I said have you ever been to uh, the North Sea or you know he said I don't do cold <laughs> so those fish are sadly lacking up there <laughs> exactly and they're not that many you know the hot spots of the world are where the abundance of the animals are and those are around the equator uh, around New Guinea, the Philippines, uh, Australia, the Seychelles, all those exotic places that you've probably never been to and I had never been to before but that's where the abundance of species are. Uh, maybe four to ten thousand species versus Three or four hundred somewhere. Well, somewhere. a lot of the fish don't do cold then. No, no. <laughs> and the pretty fish. ones, the pretty ones definitely don't. They're, no, they're the pretty the ones water. are on the reef, That's right. sunbathing. But this is this has evolved into more than a hobby because you um, have a had or have I guess you still have a picture agent. Now, what is a picture agent? Well, a picture agent is a person. Well, I don't have many more since I made the gift. I see. To the University of Miami the Marine Science School, the Rosenstiel Marine Science School and Atmosphere. Uh, a picture agent is a person who you send your pictures to, your slides, they duplicate them. This one agency I did called Image Bank in New York probably had uh, 50 or 100 agencies around the world. I mean, I got checks that were sold in France and Italy, you know, they were sold mostly to advertising agencies or book. Who needed a pretty fish picture. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, that went on for about 20 years and then I had uh, decorators and designers that sold my pictures for homes, schools, now, libraries. Those were blown up photographs though. Blown up photographs yeah, yeah. and I had a special museum box mount which was pretty unique. Uh, they weren't in a frame as such, they were on a box mount. And uh, I had one in uh, the East Coast, one in the West Coast, and one in Florida, and they, they sold a lot of pictures. And uh, I always donated the money somewhere, you know. So that was how we got started. And I did Hallmark's work for about 25 years. I did undersea well, calendars. When you, d when you, let's talk about, when Hallmark, how did, how did they, how did you decide what did they come to you and say we need a fish picture that's blue or we want how did you make the conversation work so that they knew what so you knew what they wanted? well they were buying photographs from a picture agent like mine oh I see at the time uh -huh. and I came up and I said well you know I can give you a more variety make it easy I live yeah. right here five miles away yeah. uh, when I come back from a dive trip I'll bring you up my best pictures and you just select them well that got into cards, it got into note cards, it got into uh, uh, calendars, puzzles, all kinds of things mm -hmm. that they used my pictures for. But I think the, the most uh, unique pictures I ever sold them, sold Hallmark, was one day the, the picture uh, agent there said to me, Myron, can you take a picture above water? And I said, <laughs> I said, I think I'm not I can. sure. <laughs> I think I can. And she says, Well, I know you're going to the Red Sea, and you told me you were going to spend five days in Jerusalem after your dive trip, and I need a picture of the Garden of Gethsemane, and I need a picture of uh, this reconstructed Jewish synagogue, and I need uh, an ancient synagogue, and I need a picture of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. 
well, I photographed away and uh, brought all these pictures back that I'd shot. And I ended up with a New Year's card, Jewish New Year's card, a Christian New Year's card, and a uh, picture of the Holy Sepulchre, which uh, went for, no, that Garden of Gethsemane went for the Easter card. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. I want to talk, is it different to photograph out of water than it is in the water? Oh, yes. Well, do you need a different whole setup, a camera setup? Or? Well, actually, I use the same camera, but underwater, I put it in a housing, well, and I have two yes, strobes, yeah. and it's pressure-proof. I've been down to 300 feet with the camera, and it's uh, very safe if you have a good housing and you maintain it properly. Above water, you just take it out of the housing and shoot it like so any other camera. it's the same camera. technique, basically, that you use. Right. Yeah. But, you know, you have so many elements underwater, like current, cold, poor visibility sometimes, great visibility other times, you know. So you have a lot of other factors to deal with underwater than you do above water. I know you worked with Jacques Cousteau. Yes, I did. What kind of a guy was he? Oh, he was a wonderful guy. Uh, I was in his office up in New York at World Publishing, and he just bought a bunch of my pictures for his 20-volume encyclopedia. And uh, I was sitting in his office just like you and I are sitting mm -hmm. here, and he put his hands over his eyes and bent his head down and looked at me and it said, how can I have an underwater photographer from Missouri? <laughs> in his little French accent, I can't duplicate that accent, but we both laughed. <laughs> How did he know, how did you make that contact with well, him? Well, I've met him the year before he did a speech here at Rockhurst. Mm -hmm. And I went to see him, being an underwater enthusiast. I went to see him and I introduced myself. And he said, next time you're in New York, uh, I told him my credentials. And he said, next time you're in New York, come up to World Publishing in my office. And we actually made a date, because mm -hmm. he's not there all the time, mm -hmm. you know. And we made a date and I came up and he just said, I wish I'd known you for 20, 20 years ago, you know, when he started doing all his books. That's interesting. It, because he, did he do underwater photography, or was he mostly in research of some sort? He was m mostly an oceanographer. Uh -huh. uh, so he, he was doing he research. Invented, he actually invented the aqualung, which is your breathing apparatus mm -hmm. underwater. Mm -hmm. He was an engineer, uh, oceanographer. I'm sure he did photography. The, Cousteau people did mostly video. And that's why they needed still, still photographers photography. like me uh, to do their books, because most of their stuff, well, video was actually film in those days. Yeah. I was going to say something, but I thought, no, I will <laughs> not point out how many years ago that was. <laughs> that was many years <laughs> ago. <laughs> how long did it take you to get good at it? I mean, you know, you said most of the images that you took when you removed the camera from your friend's neck, were not, you weren't very pleased with No, it. well, I didn't have a strobe at that moment. Now, talk of what is a strobe and what does it do for well, you? Well, it, it's a flash, Yes, a flash gun. And, and it only it, goes off when you hit you the... You see, when you get past 30 feet underwater, all the color's gone. Like this rug, it's gray instead of red because all the ultraviolet oh. is uh, filtered out by the water column. Mm -hmm. So in order to make this rug red, you need a to put the sunlight back in. So the flash puts the sunlight back in and the ultraviolet back in and uh, gives you the exact color of the fish or the coral or whatever you're photographing underneath. Myron, when you look at that fish and you're way down there, can you see those colors? You can't see them then with your... No, but my brain has been learned. <laughs> it's a funny brain. You know, I know <laughs> this fish is red, so I see red. I don't I know. I just know that fish is red. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. Oh, but how long did it take you to get really good at this? Oh, it took about two, three dive trips to really get good. After I had that little uh, lesson with uh, Jack McKenna, the, the uh, uh, editor of S Skin Diver magazine, mm -hmm. uh, I got a lot better, a lot better fast, because he told me the technique and the procedures, and I needed two strobes instead of one strobe, and you know. Yeah. Yeah. It was uh, a good learning moment now in my life. You also told me, which I was surprised, that you do not use a digital camera. No, well, digital is just in the last four or five years, yeah. and 
you know, I started this 50 years ago, so. Uh, I'm have you upgraded your cameras in the? In those oh yes, I have the most sophisticated film cameras, Nikon's, and uh, they're wonderful cameras and wonderful lenses. I would use the same lens probably on the digital cameras, but uh, you need a different housing. You know, if the camera button is here, on a digital camera it might be here. So you need a different housing. Right, and it's they're very expensive and you start changing equipment. Well, and you know how this stuff works. So yeah. you just keep what works. Right. <laughs> if it works, don't fix don't it. Don't fix it. But what kind of, do you use a special kind of film? Yes, I uh, started out using uh, Kodachrome and that was very good for many years. And now I've, uh, in the last 20 years, I've probably used Fuji Color, Fuji 50. That's uh, my film of choice now. When you, you can't change lenses once you're down there in that, within, within the housing, can you? How? No, but you so know, I know if I'm gonna shoot close up or if I'm gonna shoot wide angle before I go down. Ah, ah, I see, I see. And I used to go down with two cameras and once in Palau, I laid down my other camera and I looked for 30 minutes. The reef was so large, so big, I couldn't remember where so I left. somewhere down in Davy Jones' yeah, locker. So I got up and I was camera. almost in tears. I said <laughs> I left a brand new Nikonis on the reef and, and one of the kids on the boat uh, from Palau dove down and in about five minutes he had it. Oh, you got it back? Yeah. I thought maybe it was still resting in It would have been locker. if I would have <laughs> had to go look for it again. I, oh, it was, so I started not doing that. How do you choose a photo site? By the subjects. Okay, well. If I know there's a pygmy seahorse in okay. New Guinea, I'm going to go to New Guinea and find the guide who can take me there and put me on the reef next to the. But it's a big ocean, Myron. The seahorse may not swim by. Well, he lives on a sea fan. So you find a sea fan. Right. So you it's find kind of a particular like a, sea it's fan. It's kind of like a treasure hunt. It's a treasure hunt. You know, it's like hunting, but you don't kill anything. <laughs> and that's so You much capture better. the picture. Well, God forbid you should kill some of these fish. I mean, <laughs> looking for them, if you may find one of a kind or two of a kind, and right. killing them would not be a good thing to do. Eating them is would be a sin. <laughs> <laughs> well, these these kind of fish you don't eat. You, They're not you know, the reef, they wouldn't be good anyway. Probably not. You know, uh, they're too beautiful. They are, they're gorgeous, they're yeah. so beautiful. Nature has given them color that no other animal on earth has. But what you see is often a surprise. It's a surprise, yeah. And there's things I'd never seen before. You know, like one time we were, at a, we were getting fuel at the fuel dump and nobody wanted to go in because it was just rocks and sand and, and uh, the captain of the ship said, there's a Caledonia stinger down there. And I said, really? And I got dressed and loaded my camera, put everything together. And I was the only went, one that went down and I got a picture of the Caledonia stinger. I'd never seen one before, but they live in muck. And this was what you call a muck dive, you know. Are they bottom feeders? Yeah. Type? Yeah. Mm -hmm. a, and a stinger means you better get away. You better not touch him. Now he's not aggressive, he won't attack you. But after I shot 36 pictures of him, he opened his wings. He said, I've had it <laughs> <Yeah>. with you. <laughs> They're pretty sedentary. They don't move fast, yeah. you know. They kind of crawl yeah. on the bottom. So, you know, you're one of the few people I know that gets excited about a Caledonia stinger. <laughs> right. Nobody's <laughs> probably think, probably somebody thinks that's something you drink in a bar. <laughs> You have a fish, uh, that's not a fish, it's an octopus named after you. Uh, a fish? I have. You found one that I nobody. I found one, it's not an octopus, it's a lionfish. A lionfish. It's a reticulated lionfish, and it's called the Myroni Wangi, <laughs> because I defy anybody to find it in a book. I've looked in every reference book in the world, and to get a fish named after you, you really have to capture it, put it in a bottle, and send it to, some lab and for verification. And you couldn't do it, Myron. Oh, I couldn't do that. So I took a picture of it. I got one good picture. I got two shots before he scurried under the reef. Is this a big thing? No, he's thing? about he's this big. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But uh, 
it's it's a lionfish and uh did he and they op they had opened they, up to he you. opened up for me did he oh now i see, got him go. full bore and it's a beautiful shot but uh and if, and if some scientist says well that's mine that's okay i'll change the name <laughs> <laughs> but i can't find anybody who's seen it and i try you know i'm down there it's Science City at the University of Miami Rosenstiel Marine Science School, and, and I've showed it either? to every professor down there, and they couldn't find it either. What color is he? Oh, he's kind of orange and black. Ooh. He's kind of pretty. Has big wingspan, and oh, wow. he's he different. A, is, is he's he different a, from a common lionfish, although. Well, you wouldn't want a common lionfish. No, named well, I've got you. plenty of those. <laughs> When you go back, and I know you do go back to the same location, or in you know, in the, in general, do you find often that you don't recognize the seascape? It's entirely different, or it's somewhat different, or the water's changed, or the temperature. The water temperature has a lot to do with what you see, does it not? Yes. Uh, the reefs have not changed a lot, except where there's been horrific storm damage. You know what I mean? Yeah. The reefs are pretty healthy yet. And uh, so I. So you don't see a whole lot of damage from pollution? No. No. Oh. No, there's not much pollution out in the South Pacific. Yeah. Uh, where I shoot mostly are the Seychelles or Indonesia, places like that. Uh, there's not much pollution. I think. Uh, I've been to the Red Sea 13 times and. Uh, the same lionfish is at Taba that I saw th 30 years He's ago. Kidding. So he says, hi, Myron, are right. you back again? <laughs> right. But the water temperature will change occasionally, yes? Yes. Now, in New Guinea, we shot a rhinopius, which is about the ugliest thing you can see. I mean, you can't tell his head from his tail, and he has big arms, and he's green, and one, his cousin is red. And they're on the site, but uh, I went back there three years later to get another shot of it, and it was gone. And I asked uh, the captain, I said, you know, I know right where he was, and I know that's where I shot him, and they're not a very, uh, they're pretty sedentary. You know, they uh -huh. stay right there. And you can shoot a whole roll of film at them, and uh, they stay in the current. It's kind of hard to shoot because you're moving a little bit, you know. Uh -huh. But I got some good shots of him, but I just wanted another shot. And he says, they move 200 miles up the coast, really? up to Siloasi. And I said, why? Uh -huh. He said, the water temperature changed two degrees, and they don't like warm, warmer water, and they wanted to go, and they just swam till they found some cold water. And put down Colder their, water. It's not cold. Yeah, but it might be 78 versus yeah. 80, you know what I mean? But yeah. that was enough to make them move on. That's, I think that's interesting. So fish are, are really kind of delicate folks about their, about their surroundings. Yes, they are. And they all have a uh, protective mechanism, either by color or by their anemones where they live. Like you, if you ever saw the picture Nemo, that little, little angel, that little... Uh, damselfish he just jumped in and out of the out of his anemone for protection and it stings so you don't want to touch it his predator won't go in there after him you know so they all have ways of protecting little holes little cuts in the reef where they go into for protection and they hide out even from photographers sometimes I have to wait for them to come out well I, you know I think that um, undersea is a most interesting because it's you can see it more easily how one species depends on another, just like people depend on each other. So, so do right. the fish in the undersea um, denizens. Right. To just uh, to give you an example of that, two clownfish uh, were pulling a starfish along mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the bottom, mm -hmm. and the clownfish are gorgeous. They are. They look like a clown, you know, and they're beautiful. And the starfish was beautiful. A beautiful starfish with arms out like this and when I got back to the boat I said they were just dragging him along the bottom of the ocean I shot about 15 or 20 shots of them he said yeah they're taking him to their den they're gonna eat his arms off <laughs> and 
he has a red core about like that. And then they put him back out in the ocean and the arms will grow back. And then they'll start all over again. So, so the red core is about this yeah, big. Yeah, about this big. Yeah. And so then he can regenerate. All. He, yes, he So they don't kill him. They just They don't kill him. Munch. No. They eat his arms. <laughs> Isn't <laughs> the that? Starfish funny? arms. Yeah, but he grows back. He regenerates. Have, you've seen a lot of underwater denizens. Do you have any particular that you just think were special? Well, I, I think uh, the littlest thing I ever photographed was very special. And that was? That was the pygmy seahorse. He's, uh, he's about as big as your little fingernail. Uh -huh. And he's on a sea fan, and he's in current. And I had to hold on with one hand, and the sea fan was going back and forth and back and forth. And try to take a picture holding on. And I took 36 shots of that little guy. And I ha you have to be close, you know, because he's so small. Uh -huh. And uh, I think I got two good pictures. One's on the wall in my bedroom. <laughs> and it's the Papa Seahorse that takes care of the babies, is it not? Well, I guess so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I they carry so. them around. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. I think so. Where are you going next? Well, I, th I think uh, Mickey and I, my wife, would like to go back to New Guinea if things settle down around there. What are you looking for? What are you going to photograph? Well, there's uh, uh, a blue, a blue deadly octopus that I found uh, that they find down there. I've never shot that. Big or little? No, thing? he's little, but he's very, very he's deadly. Mean. Yeah, <laughs> if you remember the James Bond movie Octopussy, that was the one in the aquarium. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's very pretty. He's blue, very decorative and uh, very dangerous. Have you ever been stung? No. Mm -mm. Stabbed, stung, bitten, nothing. Well, in my early days in the Red Sea, I was trying to get this lionfish to turn around. So I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was making waves underwater. <laughs> and they back into you with their coils. And boy, he stunned my hand. And I was kind of like paralyzed for about five mm. minutes. But it went away. It was fine. Well, he sent you a very strong message. He did, and it was my fault. <laughs> But I didn't touch him, but he, he back. thought you were going to. Yeah, he thought I was going to touch him. Now, you never mention anything with a shell. You don't, do you, are you interested? Mm -hmm. in There's shells on the site. There's all kind of. No, no, the animals that live in a shell, like the oysters and the clams. Yes, and the I've shot those. And they're, in the, uh, they're also on the site. We have some beautiful uh, shells and uh, the animal inside, the animal peeking out with their long tentacles. and. You can see them peeking out of the shells, and uh, they're oh, that's uh, so interesting. Yeah. Well, I am moved to ask you because while you're down there, do you ever see any wrecks that have gold or silver or jewels? Or? Well, glad you asked because last year we went. Uh, I went with the university. Uh, my professor, uh, John Gifford, is a marine archaeologist. He's my liaison at the university, and uh, he asked me to go to Bermuda with him and photograph some archaeological sites, some wrecks in the Bermuda Triangle. And uh, of course, I just hopped on that. I'm not really a wreck photographer, but I, I enjoyed going down and with my wide angle lens and uh, shooting the parts of the wreck. Some of them are 200 years old, and they're just scattered all over the bottom. But so, you didn't find anything? No, I shot boilers and oh. nameplates. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that, we can't use that. <laughs> but, I, but as I say, thank you to Myron Wang for, for coming and sharing with us his wonderful hobby that has turned into a much more than that. Um, I'm reminded of the poem that, we're going to, we want to go down to the sea again, to the gull's way and the whale's way, like the wind's like a whetted knife. And I know that you're on your way. So I would say to you, thank you, Myron. Fair winds and following seas. Thank you, We'll Mary. see you soon. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you so much for being with us. We'll see you soon again, too, because it's our community, and I'm Mary Davidson. Bye.